I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. And I want to thank all of you joining me. This is, I've been at this conference since 8 a.m. on Monday, and I'll tell you I'm super excited about this panel. The Almond Board has been investing in what we often call biomass research or finding new and more diverse ways to add value to our co-products for six years now. And we funded some, some very interesting and sometimes called weird and wild uh, research, uh, feeding almond hulls to black soldier flies, which actually turns out to be a legit industry, um, uh, a few other things along the way. But what really excites me about today is that you're going to hear about commercial investment. You're not going to hear about research. So we have three startup companies that are investing in um, using almond co-products to make new commercial products. Um, and then we're gonna hear about a very exciting uh, sort of public-private partnership initiative in the San Joaquin Valley that is aiming specifically to attract not just commercial investment, but actual location of facilities that would use First among them, Almond Co. products, and then a few other things that come out of the ag economy. So, um, really excited that you took the, the stayed with us and you're joining us here today. Um, I will introduce the panel, and then I'm going to do a few more uh, introductory remarks about uh, the journey we've been on, and then I'm going to turn it over to these outstanding people. So, on our panel today, we have Paul Kephart with Nut Jobs, and you'll learn about what they do. Roland Lau with Renut, um, Taylor Heisley Cook with The Herd Company, which if you went to the Global Market Development uh, talk this morning, you heard a little snapshot on that. And last but very much not least, Karen Warner with Beam Circular. So you'll hear from each one of them. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, we have now six years of ABC investment in co-product um, utilization, looking for more diverse and higher value markets. And after many years of research, we were confronted with a question that of um, these things, we're, we've done some great research to show what's technically feasible, but what's really um, a possibility from a market perspective? Which of these uh, technical options could actually compete in a marketplace of um, raw materials that get used in a whole very diverse set of things. So you're not at all uh, asked to read this slide. If you came to the Almond conference session last year, we talked a little, uh, two years ago we talked about this. Um, but basically this just gives you, you can see each line is a very different um, product opportunity using some component of almond co-products, hulls, shells, or woody biomass to make some kind of um, product and it's starting with the sort of lower value potential high volume things are in the top section examples of soil amendments things like biochar industrial sorbents as you might know almond shells are currently used as animal bedding they are absorptive and low cost so those are called very minimal processing kind of low value um, opportunities um, then, then in the middle section are when we start to get to some higher value things uh, of a broad range where you're extracting something from the hulls or shells. Uh, everything from food grade ingredients, um, um, packaging materials, which we're going to hear about today, uh, all the way up to sort of nutraceutical extracts, which could be, um, which would be very costly because they're far more levels of processing and maybe not take as much volume. And then the last platform, all, all product um, opportunities around what's called torrefaction or pyrolysis. You're burning the co-products in very controlled conditions to make high quality carbon for a variety of uses. So what this market assessment helped us do is understand um, some of the um, economics of different market opportunities. I can't tell you enough how I think if I asked this audience here, you each, I'd probably get 10 additional ideas of can't we use almonds co-products to do this, this, or that. But then ultimately, if we're going to get commercial development of any of those, it's going to, it means that the co-product has to have a reliable feedstock that those companies can 
get year round, year after year, if they're gonna actually build a facility. They have to um, be cost competitive with whatever the feedstock currently is. Uh, it's, you know, it, the, the um, other aspects of the, um, of the business um, case um, in terms of, you know, is it, how, does it, does the processing produce a lot of other co-products that might be really difficult to dispose of in a highly regulated environmental conditions like California? So a lot of other factors that took into it. So it got us to really start to think about what is the role of the Almond Board and how can we, sorry, I'll go back, and how can, what can we do, not to just fund research, but to, to either make the opportunity more visible to all these types of industries, because I don't know a lot about all these types of <laughs> industries. Um, so what can we do to learn about them, to figure out how we can make the opportunity visible to them? How can we de-risk it in some way? Um, and how can we provide more information that helps them see the business case of using Almond Co. products? And what's really exciting is that I think we are on that path very firmly. We're not funding as much research as we did. We still do a little bit, um, including with some of our partners here. Um, but increasingly, we are speaking to the investment community and to the private sector. So. Um, I wanted to also update uh, before we jump in on a very exciting area that we talked about if you happen to come to this session last year. Um, and I will give my colleague Guang Wei Huang uh, full credit for getting us on this pathway. And the uh, concept here is that the almond hull um, is not just nutritious for dairy cows, but it's actually nutritious for people too. Um, I, as I always say, the almond hull is equivalent to the part of a peach or apricot that we all enjoy. So there is a lot of good phytonutrients in there. There's fiber and there are sugars that, that can result in a uh, very palatable taste. So we have had a program with a private um, food development company called Matson um, that is now complete. We, we looked at a broad range of potential um, food product concepts that would use uh, powdered almond hulls or almond hulls as an ingredient in human food um, and had some really exciting opportunities that um, came from that that we continue to pursue. Just in as, as an example, Matson used almond hulls as a partial substitute for the ingredients in a nutritional bar. This is sort of equivalent to a cliff bar is the recipe that they developed and you can see here, if you, um, if you uh, were to, to take this commercial and put a nutritional label on it, um, the bar that has uh, almond hulls as an ingredient provides five grams of fiber, which is equivalent to almost 40% of your recommended daily rec uh, amount of fiber compared to 19% in a cliff bar. And very importantly, you have the effect of carbohydrates by using almond hulls compared to the, the standard product and 30 fewer calories. So at a time when uh, increasingly the food industry is recognizing that we, that uh, as Americans and Europeans and many uh, parts of the world, we are not getting sufficient fiber in our diet, um, this is a really compelling case for um, the use of almond hulls as a food ingredient. So we're on a path to continue this, we hope to finish off the food safety studies this coming year and put together the package for the Food and Drug Administration to get almond hulls recognized as a safe food ingredient. We have been talking to food companies that interact with the Almond Board to make them aware of this and we already have some interest from companies like uh, Mars or the Kind Bar folks in getting some samples of the uh, almond hulls as, um, so they can start testing that out. So that's the path we're on. We funded a lot of research. By doing this market assessment now, we're asking ourselves, what can we do to educate manufacturers, pilot and prototype samples um, to help them get in, a, um, to assess the commercial opportunity there and reduce some of the regulatory hur hurdles. So you'll hear um, some of those examples on the panel today. And with that, I am gonna turn it over to Paul to kick us off. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming today and I can't tell you how happy I am to 
be on this panel with all these great denovators and and um, <clears throat> I want to share with you some of the background and the current status of nut jobs. And we are transforming both hull and shell into single-use plastics for a number of horticultural and uh, agricultural applications. I just happen to be the chief nut job in charge. <laughs> uh, we really set about this for several goals, utilize and optimize the, the uh, co-products and benefit the haulers and shellers and the farmers. And then also uh, we're working with major manufacturers because many of them have a problem with plastics and the regulations that are coming through as well as their own footprint. They're being more environmentally aware. Consumers are driving the uh, shift towards bioplastics and biocomposites. And then um, what I've done is created some biocomposites that are alternatives to both styrene, polystyrene, and uh, polypropylene. And we do have a significant problem with plastics. Uh, polypropylene is exactly the same age as I am. And uh, it is a miraculous uh, material. However, now there's nearly 4 million tons of it produced. and. Uh, it's creating a problem. In terms of landfill volume, polystyrene takes up 35% of all our landfills. These plastics are associated with cancer and endocrine disruption. 57 of these ingredients are found in most mother's milk throughout the US. So significant health problems and environmental risk uh, associated with plastics. and. In terms of how to start, I'm a landscape architect and I own my own nursery and I thought about this. Uh, we received a contract to grow five million units of plants for the Apple campus. And um, it occurred to me that the container, the, poly, the black pot that is ubiquitous, was designed to last 450 to 500 years. Now why would we do that? Why would we take a single-use item and not design it for end of life? And so this is where we started. Our, our formulations cover many different applications in terms of packaging, uh, both food grade and shipping, cooler packs and what have you. But we decided to take on the horticultural industry because it's what we know and we can inform. And um, we... Um <coughs> Uh, I'm an ecologist, as I mentioned, and landscape architect, and I, I looked at this from nature-based design, and I thought, well, what's the perfect package? What's that analog in nature? And when I thought of the almond hull and shell, it passes two of the packaging criteria, impact resistance and thermal performance. And I separated those two in a very simple lab, uh, my studio, and I used a, a grinder and a a coffee grinder and a tortilla press and a microwave oven and ruined my family's blender, but I was able to produce some really, really interesting materials and that's led us to uh, develop these types of products for the horticultural and the agricultural uh, markets. Uh, our patents or four patents cover all these formulations around polystyrene and polypropylene with bio-based resins. Uh, we have been able to uh, uh, commercialize some of these lab trials, and now we have uh, figured out how to really enter the plastics industry in terms of what it means to manufacture compound and injection mold and thermal form this material. And that wasn't an easy process, primarily because the temperature ranges of processing are quite uh, different. Uh, uh, for example, this has been injection molded. We can, can now injection mold these pots 16 every second and a half, which was good news, and we now have our first uh, customer for a significant amount of the material. So we're, we're on the way. Our next effort is around foam and uh, polystyrene replacements. Uh, and our value here is really the fact that we can uh, – go right into current manufacturing processes and equipment. So there's not a big learning curve or a change for our clients that they can just take this material, 
and injection molded or thermal form it as an alternative to the polypropylene they're using. There are some tricks to this around temperature and melt flow index and physical and mechanical properties, but all that has we've, we've worked on and, and um, we're now advancing into some equipment uh, and man manufacturing items where people are seeking these kinds of uh, alternatives. This is actually uh, nearly at parity with uh, petroleum, the petroleum-based index, which is, uh, you know, I've, I've always said if this is going to be sus environmentally sustainable, it has to be economically viable. And the fact is that if we can get close to parity with uh, current oil-based products, that's a win for everyone. That means greater amount of adoption and greater volumes of application. And then uh, for us, it's, it's a high margin business. It, it works for us in terms of the way we approach the market. Everybody wins on this, it's a value add. Our process and supply chain's pretty simple. We're going from the orchard, huller and chellers. We now have set up our pilot production facility near Turlock and then we're doing our bio comp compounding with others at, at a larger scale, about uh, 400 pounds or, uh, excuse me, 4,000 pounds of our pellets per hour. And then, and that's our business model. We're not actually manufacturing end use products. We're manufacturing the formulations in pellet form, just like any other kind of plastic that goes to the customer. That's it in a nutshell, so uh, I'll be around if you have any questions or you want to see any of these samples, you can reach me at paul at nutjobs.com. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Great puns in there, intended. And I saw some growers get really excited when you announced that you have your first facility in Turlock, so um, very excited about that. And we're I looking, think I'm- We're looking for partners. There you go. <laughs> Any hullers and shellers in the region? Come and talk to Paul. Um, also, folks don't know this, as big as almonds is in this industry, I'm pretty confident the nursery industry is among the top 10 ag segments in California. So it's an enormous number of these black plastic pots that we have in our state right 1. now. 1.7 trillion annually. 1.7 trillion annually in the United States. In the United can States, you, and a lot of those in California, because we make retail as well as commercial, you know, for uh, the ag industry itself. And he's planted an almond orchard. All right, thank you. Um, over to Roland. You are next up, I believe. Hopefully, the clicker will show that to be the case. <laughs> Thank you, Josette. Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. Glad that you found the time. Um, I'm Roland, the CEO and the co-founder of Renat. We are a Swiss-based food technology startup. And you know, when food guys think about almonds, we don't think about the applications of the side products into plastics and stuff. We think, we think about food. And that was our mission since about 20 years. My chief engineer, Tilo, who's always uh, joining me here. Uh, we've invented some manufacturing methods to get more of, more of the good out of raw materials through new manufacturing processes at low temperatures, no oxidation. And uh, this we did in chocolate, in coffee, in herbs and spices. And now we turn our head to the culinary nuts. It's a beautiful category. And it's a huge category that we found out, you know, it is uh, 55 million tons per year. So compared to the uh, oh. green coffee, I mean We're tree nuts. We're up to three billion in California. Not pounds, just uh, in tons, almonds. 55 yeah. million tons, sorry. Yeah. Um, so it's a huge, huge amount, a, 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 huge, a huge business opportunity. Um, what we do is basically we take the whole nut with the kernel inside and the shell on it so the in-shell nut, um, we add four, port four parts of water and then we do different milling steps. We go through two or three milling steps, corundum stone mills, um, tooth colloid mills, and then we get a slurry. And this slurry we then drive through a decanter. 
It's a centrifuge that you see on the picture here, which does the phase separation. So we separate again the slurry into two to three products or extracts, one being the solids. The, the, the solids, they're wet. We can dry them afterwards or keep them wet for some applications. The other extract is a drink, which, which I'm here uh, drinking all the time. Um, and the third extract, optionally, we can get a oil out of the nuts. So these are the three outputs. Um, there is no waste anymore, and all these three products we can bring into the food nutritional um, cycle. This little movie here, I walk you through how this works. So this is the starting material, in shell nuts. Then we do a debacterization and a roasting in shell. This uh, brings the log 5 reduction of pat uh, pathogens. Then we do a first dry milling, a pre-crushing with a hammer mill to get the particle size to like 8 millimeters. Um, and this we then turn into different mills. We add water, ambient temperature water in the ratio 1 to 4. You see that here. And here, the part of the extraction takes uh, place, and we get out this uh, slurry, which has particles below 100 micron. Um, and then this is the slurry we uh, feed into this machine, which is the phase separator machine, the decanter, separating again the solids, which is then our almond flour, from the liquid, which is our almond drink, and optionally from the um, fat, which is the almond um, fat. So you see this here, it's a ready-to-drink product. You can uh, do a UHD treatment, stabilization, and then do the filling and sell it. Here you see the different phases. That's the, the flour, it's wet. You can use it for ice cream applications in a wet uh, phase, or if you go for bakery or other products, we have to dry it. Here you see some applications. I'm going to speak about them in a sec. Uh, different food products that we are working on. You see the creaminess. We have a foam-stable drink. We, we can also use it to add for coffee and, um, and no waste. So what is the primary benefit out of this? It's basically we boost the yield from uh, one pound of nuts uh, as we don't have any waste with the shell, so we get um, these uh, uh, products out there that we all nurture into the nutritional cycle. What, is benefit, what are benefits to nut processors? Um, they have a more yield. That's an economically interesting factor, as you can imagine, because the shell, let's say the non pearl almond, is like a 35% ratio versus the kernel um, from a mass standpoint. But if you look into, let's say, Spanish almonds, we have 65% of shell versus the the kernel. Hazelnuts is like 50-50, peanuts like 30%. Well, you all know, th know that, but we're looking at this uh, at from a global perspective on all the kind of nuts. So I think there is a lot of um, yield improvement possible with these uh, ratios. And then we have lower cost because we don't shell um, the nuts anymore. The process that you just got demonstrated is a fully continuously running system. So no batch processing, it's really apted for high volumes. These phase separation machines they're using for wastewater treatment, and some of them are also used you know, to produce, for example, oat milk. So they have the soaked grains in water, and then they run this through these kind of decanters to separate, to get the oat milk. So it's an established technology, and I'm glad we have our partner here also today, Mike here from GEA Westphalia. That's the largest number, glo the globally number one company doing these machines. And uh, we're happy that they are onboarded here in this project. Um, the other benefit is product innovation. Uh, we have a lot of fiber in it. You can imagine the shell mainly consists of um, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, which is fiber. And this we add to the product. So that's diversification, that's innovation. We have too much sugar in our diet. We have 
enough fat, enough protein, at least in the Western diet, but we really lack on fiber. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the big contributions we can do when we put the shell, which is fiber, into the food products. So here are a couple of food products that we are thinking about. Um, bakeries, certainly a, a huge application area. Um, then chocolate confectionery spreads. So this is an almond spread. We put on the hazelnut spread, we also did, where we can use our flour with the shell as a filler into these products to reduce the sugar content. So without mentioning names, the global leader of the chocolate hazelnut spreads, they have 50% of sugar. Can you imagine 50% of sugar? And 13% um, of the meat of hazelnuts in it. So what we did is basically we did 26% of our hazelnut flour and reduced the same uh, ratio, the, the sugar content from 50 to 37%. And it's a beautiful creamy product. It's full of flavor, etc. cetera. Um, it has more fiber now in it, but less sugar. So that's one of the big, big uh, potential uh, applications. Then on the right side, the drink, we brought some samples there back there. You can try it. It's really smooth. We can do a clean label product uh, out of this. Uh, and this might be a new, a new category in the plant-based drink it's from coming from the whole, from the whole nut. Just quickly, the composition for those who are interested in, we bring uh, the fiber in it, the protein, uh, the water, and we did all the tests with different almond varieties um, and also for the drink. Um, the one that you're gonna taste here uh, has about 8% of fat, so a lot. I think to commercialize it, we will have to dilute it a little bit to make it economically uh, feasible. What is our business model? We have uh, a patent on this method and we roll this out globally um, and uh, we have just obtained the regulatory approval for commercializing these products here in the US. That's why we're here actually um, because we're based in Switzerland but as you can imagine we're doing the same regulatory processes in Europe with like 30 countries so Every country has its questions and it takes about two to three years to get the regulatory approval. So you're much faster here. <laughs> we got uh, self-grass, generally recognized as safe uh, in the US for almonds, and that's why, why we're here. Yeah, that's uh, our purpose is really to bring this beautiful almond with the shell into the nutritional cycle. I think this is a high added value for uh, innovation, for differentiation, for new business, and to bring some, some good stuff into this uh, world and in the stomach of consumers. So thank you very much for your attention. Excellent, so now we're gonna get out of, uh, into a whole nother category and turn over to Taylor to talk about what her company is doing. Hello everybody, I'm Taylor Heisley Cook, co-founder and CEO of The Herd Co., where we make it possible to make clothes from agricultural waste. So we've been so fortunate to work with the Almond Board over the past year to evaluate waste from orchards, so the trees that are being removed from orchards as a viable input for apparel. Uh, I personally have a background in the apparel industry. I was at a brand in the materials and sustainability department where I saw firsthand how desperately we wanted to change to more sustainable materials and all the problems we were having trying to make that shift. When most people reach for their favorite t-shirt, they don't often think about what it's made from or consider how it got into their closet, but the apparel industry relies on so much land and water every year to grow plants specifically for apparel production. And by 2030, that demand is expected to double which is not possible. We feel that that land and water should be prioritized for food growth and use the byproducts from those systems to make clothes. And the industry knows this. The industry is hungry for sustainable and closed loop materials that will allow us to continue making clothes without destroying the planet. So a quick overview of fibers that are used in apparel today. There are three main types. There's natural fiber like cotton or linen, synthetic fiber like polyester or nylon, and then there are man-made cellulosic fibers, or MMC fibers, which are known by the highlighted names you see up on the screen. Now, 
when most people hear those highlighted names, they, they assume they're synthetic, but they're actually made from trees. And it is the fastest growing part of mm. the apparel industry. Uh, it is projected to be $60 billion industry by 2028. Again, these are made from a specific type of tree that is grown exclusively for apparel production. So last year, 200 million trees of the 200 million of these trees were logged for apparel, mm. and this year, 300 million trees were logged for apparel. So 50% wow. growth in one year, and with our work with the almond board, we have evaluated almond trees as an input for this process. So we take almond orchard chippings and we use our patented process to transform it into agrolose, which is an MMC pulp made from 100% agricultural waste, in this case, almond trees, uh, that apparel brands use to make clothing. Now, we are a different, we are a waste stream of material that's normally you know, taken out and burned or thrown away, but importantly, our product is the same quality as traditional pulp, and we're able to offer it at the same price as traditional pulp. So it's an easy choice for manufacturers and an easy choice for brands. Being made from waste is a huge part of our story. It gets it, consumers very excited, but the magic really does lie in our patented system. It is a zero emission process. It is a closed loop system. We recapture and reuse over 99% of our solvent every time we run it. And all of our byproducts are used by other sustainable manufacturing partners, so there is no waste. We also, when compared to traditional pulping technology, use half as much water and 90% less energy. So it is a dramatically more sustainable project on, on all fronts. Of course, there are other players in the space doing similar things, but right now we are the only company able to produce a viable MMC pulp from this material and offer it at a cost competitive price to the industry giants that are using uh, the traditional trees for the process. This is our team. You've already met me. Uh, the rest of our team, David has a background in the sustainable textile venture space. Uh, Charles, our CTO, invented the technology uh, as a grad student at uh, Riverside. Uh, he and also led the research project with the Almond Board to evaluate <laughs> the almond trees. Michael has been commercializing technology for the past 30 years, taking it out of the lab and into the market. And Ciara is an industry veteran, having worked on both the fiber side and the textile side. And here is the man himself in the lab. So this is part of our almond evaluation process. Uh, a lot of our work has been to produce a pulp that is a one-to-one -one replacement for the traditional pulp. So measuring those, those metrics and numbers to make sure it can be a drop-in replacement for manufacturers. The apparel supply chain is very complicated, so it was important that we disrupted it as little as possible from a logistic perspective. Uh, so we are thrilled to say that we did officially produce a fiber, a drop-in replacement fiber a couple months ago. Here's the fiber made from, from agrolose. And now we are working uh, with brands to try to develop capsule collections for that. So these pulp trials, uh, initial pulp trials were supported by Patagonia. The pulp trials for the almond project was supported by the almond board. Uh, we've done fiber valuation, validation with the top fiber extrusion company in the world. And now we're moving into our larger optimization facility, which will increase our output from 100 grams a day to 10 kilograms a day, which is enough to actually produce some capsule collections with brands. And we are working with brands within this Fashion for Good ecosystem that we're proud to be a part of, which is the premier accelerator program for material scientists in the apparel space. So that is what we do and who we are, and happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Yeah, we'll have questions, plenty of time for questions at the end of all of uh, this, the remarks here. So very exciting. And uh, last but not least, I'll turn it over to Karen Warren, who's just been the ideal partner for the almond industry to convene a network and an ecosystem, as we say, um, that actually gets companies into the valley and uh, provides, helps provide the information, the connections to actually start thinking about um, making commercial investments in the valley. And, the fact that Paul was able to announce his first pilot facility in Turlock is that because of some people he met at an event that Karen hosted. So really fantastic partner for us and very right. excited Karen could join us here today.
Taylor, I'm so, I'm so excited about this facility. It's very much um, what we're all about. So hi, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here and so honored to be up here with these amazing innovators. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Beam Circular. We are a nonprofit organization that really serves to connect the dots between innovators, government, large-scale business, growers, and the ag industry, um, and the communities that are needed to really scale up innovations in the bioproduct space. Um, we really work to unlock the power of agricultural communities to be leaders and beneficiaries of the incredible innovations out there that take waste or byproducts, co-products, residues from the food and ag system and turn that biomass into value. And we think about that value both in terms of economic value, um, support for the resilience of the food and ag system, um, the creation of quality jobs for the communities that surround our food and ag system, as well as environmental solutions. Um, we are really big tent when we think about the opportunities and what we refer to as the circular bioeconomy. Um, the bioeconomy, we are, are thinking about many different feedstocks. So we are focused on um, waste streams or residues from um, the incredible diversity of agricultural um, crops and industries um, in California and in the, the North San Joaquin Valley where we are anchored. I'll talk more about our, our region of focus. Um, we're also looking at the biomass that comes from food manufacturing and food processing as well as municipal solid waste. But we are especially interested in things like almond holes and shells and orchard, um, orchard material that uh, we have in such extraordinary abundance here in California. Um, and that often goes, if not wasted, then potentially underutilized. Um, we are big tent in terms of the actual technologies or processes in the middle of what you can do um, technologically to convert that material into something of higher value. And then we are big tent in terms of products. We kind of think about everything other than pharmaceuticals that you can do with biotechnology, um, whether that's fuels and energy to um, materials, food applications, and um, agricultural um, products um, and beyond. This overall um, se uh, sector um, of the, of the bioeconomy is really essential and fundamentally changing industries across the global supply chain. And we are in this kind of hockey stick moment of growth for the use of biology to change the way we make things. Um, th there are estimates that you know the global um, value of the bioeconomy in the coming one um, to two decades will be between four and thirty trillion dollars. Um, this is not about any individual product segment or single industry. This is about transforming the way we make many, 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 many different things. And in particular, a transition from petrochemicals as a core input to many different um, industries to um, these organic materials and ideally the waste and byproducts or co-products of existing food and ag activities as the inputs for many, many different useful products. Um, Beam Circular is uh, grounded in the North San Joaquin Valley of California. I was born and raised here in that region um, in Oakdale in Stanislaus County, and I'm currently based in Modesto. Um, so we work with San Joaquin, Stanislaus, and Merced counties in particular, but I will note that um, we really, at a mission level and in terms of connections with industry and with agricultural players, are thinking much more broadly about the state of California and the state of California's potential leadership globally in in this sector. Um, but our anchor region is really special and it's chosen for a reason. Um, so this tri-county area is about 1.6 million people, um, as folks here likely know, are is really in the center of so much of the kind of powerhouse industries of California. Not only are we, you know, agricultural production leaders, we specifically in the case of almonds produce a third of California's almonds, um, we are also the next door neighbors of the San Francisco Bay Area, which which is the global leading uh, most concentrated hub of biotechnology resources and innovation, um, and also, as everyone knows, such a source of um, venture capital and other innovation assets. Um, so we have, and then we have the Sierras and the forested regions to the north and the, the east of this region, which means we're really in the center of the most productive agricultural region um, uh, in the US, um, right next to biotechnology and other innovation um, centers of excellence, um, and then 
also we are surrounded by broader forested regions, all of which makes us really uniquely suited for the scale up of activities in this space. Also very unique about the North San Joaquin Valley, and this is unique in the broader Central Valley, is we in this tri-county region have several of the largest operations in different segments of food processing and food manufacturing. Um, uh, you know, Blue Diamond, Gallo Winery, Hillmar Cheese, and I could go on and on enlisting global leaders in food manufacturing and processing that are located in this tri-county area. Um, we did this really deep dive analysis of um, regional capacity for bioindustrial manufacturing scale up. That's the kind of industry term that we're using to reference that big tent of everything non pharmaceutical that you can do with biology and creating bioproducts. Um, and we are the only region in the country that has this combination of three really exciting criteria for making us a rich and nurturing place for these types of companies to scale. Um, one is, again, this being a center of large-scale ag production, meaning we have an abundance of feedstock. We also, in the same place, are in the leading level tier of concentration of manufacturing activity. On this map, it's a little small, but you'll, you can see there are only actually five place, um, counties county segments in the country that are highlighted in blue. Those are the only five areas in the United States that have large-scale ag happening in the same place as the leading level of, of manufacturing. It's really rare, and it's important for the scale-up of these activities with bioproducts because you need to have supply chain infrastructure and workforce capabilities and expertise relevant to manufacturing adjacent to the sources of the feedstock that are inputs for these, um, for these bio-based products. So the combination of those industries and capabilities is really special and unique. And then we are the only place that has those two qualities right next to the uh, really superstar tech hub, and in our case, specifically a biotechnology um, uh, a hub of activity. So really unique in the United States, um, and we are seizing this opportunity through public-private collaboration and the launch of what we call the Bioeconomy Agriculture and Manufacturing, or B initiative. Um, our work really takes place as a portfolio of projects and strategies and programs, all of which are designed to be a really supportive environment and ecosystem for companies and innovators um, like the ones we're hearing from today um, to base their production operations and scale those operations up. Um, we are connecting the agricultural community with these bioproduct opportunities, supporting the development of the supply chain, and supporting the development of an aligned workforce system that's actually preparing workers with the skills they need to be the workers and employees of these production companies. So we're thinking about kind of all the pieces of the puzzle that really go into place to create a cluster around an industry um, and to support that industry to grow. Um, we've been really lucky to have tremendous partners from across um, uh, business and government at the local and the state level and beyond, um, as well as innovators at the table. Um, Berkeley National Laboratory has been highly involved in our work. The Almond Board of California has been a tremendous partner in this work, and we are continuing to grow this ecosystem of collaborators. Um, I will just highlight briefly here that as we think about our opportunity to, to, to support the growth and the scale up of this work, we acknowledge that there are really important barriers to scale. And Josette was talking earlier about kind of investment in research, transitioning to investment in commercialization and translating all of the incredible innovation in R&D that's out there into practice and use in the market. And that's what we're really focused on. There are, um, uh, there's kind of uh, amazing things happening and that have been happening for years in R&D in this space, but we need to, in order to have economic um, and environmental impact for the ag um, industry as well as for communities, we have to be scaling those innovations up in the market, and so that's what we are specifically focused on. I wanted to highlight a couple kind of exciting projects that are part of our portfolio of work in creating this regional ecosystem. Um, one is that we are in development on a very significant innovation campus and test bed manufacturing facility that will be um, built in Stanislaus County to really serve as an anchor asset for this broad um, sector as it grows across the region. Um, we've been in design on that this year and we're really looking forward to that being truly a global center of excellence for the scale up of innovations in this space. Um, there is a 
incredibly critical gap or shortage in capacity for scale-up manufacturing in the United States and globally. Right now, many startups prove out their technologies at Berkeley Lab, um, just over an hour from Modesto and Emeryville at a, um, at a lab there, and then go to Europe when they're ready to take their next step in scale because the United States does not have enough contract manufacturing, and in particular, scale-up contract manufacturing facilities. So we're really, we're really looking to address that gap, keep those companies here, enable them to use the regionally available feedstocks that we have in the almond in industry and beyond. And then I want to highlight a really exciting thing, kind of a preview for you all of some news that will be um, announced really soon, which is that um, with support from the Almond Board, we have um, uh, we worked with a firm called EcoStrat to complete a study of this region's availability of nut crop. Um, biomass for use in bio-based products, and we've completed what's called a BDO zone, or Bioeconomy Development Opportunity Zone Certification. So this is a process that does a really deep industry-recognized study of a geography's um, availability of a given type of biomass or feedstock for bioproduct facilities. Um, and then it assesses that strength of the availability of that feedstock and gives it a letter grade. Um, and we, this is a preview, there will be an announcement of this um, study coming soon and we'll be excited to share that out, but we are anticipating that this region is going to be receiving the highest grade certification for availability, availability of nut crop feedstocks. Um, that's a double A rating, it's the highest rating that has been provided to any um, region that's done a BDO zone certification. Um, and we're um, you know, really excited about this opportunity to market um, the availability and abundance of um, almond byproducts and other nut crop byproducts for use in bioproduction operations. Um, we are very, uh, unique and special in California and in the North San Joaquin Valley to have such a strong volume and readiness of the supply of those materials. And then just a couple last notes in terms of where we're at in momentum for this work. Um, we launched in January of this year and r have raised a little over $15 million from public and private sources, federal, state, and local, um, to seed this initiative to really invest in the infrastructure, the workforce development, and the connections that are needed to really accelerate the scale up of this, this sector. Um, we are very actively looking for um, new and growing partners in this work. And so so would love um, to connect with folks and I'll just land on a really uh, fun visit we had earlier this year um, with uh, Secretary Ross from, from CDFA um, uh, to, to visit some of the sites around our region that relate to this ecosystem and you can see a beautiful pile of holes there <laughs> on the right as a symbolic representation of the incredible um, opportunity that we have in our region and in this industry um, to advance and create new value through these byproducts. So I'll end there, and please, um, please reach out. I'm Karen at beamcircular.org, and would love to hear from you. So I can't stress enough that AA rating that we expect on this supply chain reliability assessment. Um, we all work in the almond industry. We know our size. If you're in the hulling and shelling business, <laughs> you know how big those piles get. But I'm never, I never cease to be surprised anymore at how the rest of the country and the rest of the world doesn't have a grasp of what California ag looks like. Um, you know, if you talk about uh, bio-based industries or biofuels, immediately people go to corn in the Midwest, whether it's corn ethanol or it's corn stover for cellulosic um, biofuels. They don't recognize the incredible volume of our co-products and the fact that our co-products are already aggregated in a very finite number of facilities spread over a few hundred miles along very uh, good transportation corridors as opposed to corn stover which has to be then harvested because it normally isn't off of millions of acres and somehow aggregated. So the economics and the scale of of uh, what we do both in terms of our crops but also in terms of our co-products is just not on the radar of um, investors and companies across the country, let alone across the world. Um, 
because California agriculture is often not recognized for as, uh, as large as we are. So for us, this BDO zone rating, we hope, is going to be, um, is really elevate that visibility. This program, the BDO zone program, is backed by a number of very large corporate banks and investors and some CPG brands that are looking for those alternatives to plastics. Um, so we hope that this is a chance to really elevate the investment opportunity combined with, um, and we heard a little bit about it from some of the speakers, California, as much as sometimes those regulations can be very hard for us, provides a very clear market signal in things like the biofuels industry, uh, the plastics, um, looking for alternatives, and that policy environment tells companies that between our population and our market um, size here in the state, plus that policy environment, and now hopefully seeing the feedstock reliability and um, feasibility is really a unique combination um, to add into uh, Karen. You somehow got to get those regulatory signals in there. But um, so I really am very excited that this is just the, the, the initial ramp up of what we hope we'll see is a lot of activity in the Central Valley. So um, stay tuned because it's really exciting time. So open it up for comments or questions. We have plenty of time. Um, don't be shy. Oh, everyone's tired after a few weeks. Brian, if you can come to the mic so that, I don't know if we're being, if it's being recorded, it is. So if you come to the mic, that way it's helpful. Okay, thank you, okay, we're good? Okay, thank you guys for a great presentation. You weren't lying to us that this was the most exciting one uh, of the session. So uh, my question is, do you guys, uh, what the most sought after biomass? Is it uh, shells, is it whole shells, is it the trees themselves? <laughs> they might all have different answers. <laughs> yes, and. Yes, and. Yeah, I think. But I can take Go for it. In terms of our research and our applications, I think that hull is at the greatest demand and at the greatest price point, primarily because of its uh, protein content and use for animal feeds. So that's where I see it at this point. I think the. the uh, Tree waste is up and coming, and now that there are end use applications, uh, we're going to see greater demand there. And then I would think everything is followed by shell because it's been a, a previously undervalued uh, feedstock. Would you agree? Or yeah, I, I mean, debate? I you know, obviously um, depends on um, the specific application that you're yeah. going for, but you know, from just to give you an example, because I mean, ultimately it's going to be a question of you know, how, what will be the largest type of industry that might scale across the state, right? Mm -hmm. So these are all fantastic um, and hopefully will be commercially successful and start um, using some more and more of our biomass when they start commercial production. But if I were to think about sort of what are the really large scale news sources, it's probably in that sort of torrefaction mm -hmm arena where you're starting to get into low carbon fuels, which are going to be pressed harder and harder in our state, both for transportation and for the grid. Um, and actually in the research that was done, both the Almond Board funded research and some of the stuff commercially, you can use any of the co-products in that um, system. There's not a significant difference in the energy potential from a biofuels perspective. I think Paul alluded to one challenge in thinking about the different feedstocks just from almonds is holes already have a really viable market. So they are fairly expensive as a feedstock and probably you're gonna have to go to a pretty high value new market um, to compete with dairy feed at this point in time. Obviously the dairy feed prices have fluctuated. Any holer in show will tell you that. I see Mike Kelly nodding his head. Of, $30 a ton at one point, so, um, but the price point on hulls will always be probably the highest, and so you're going to have to look at, at things that really can compete at that price point, but. Um, well, Karen, the, the discussion around energy conversion, yeah. I think the jury is still out on the economic viability, and it's, while there was a great effort initially, uh, I think that some of that didn't play out as anticipated, and there's going to be a retry. Yep. 
and hopefully that can uh, prove out uh, a better economic result. I, I will just add the just a brief comment to add to that that um, I would highlight opportunities in sustainable aviation fuels mm -hmm. as something that is receiving both yeah. tremendous federal investment and state attention and in thinking about the different feedstock sources or byproducts. The, the space of woody biomass utilization has been challenging and is such an area of prioritization yep. from the state of California perspective because it is not just about our agricultural um, woody biomass, but also our forested regions. It is part of wildfire management. So there's a push factor there in terms of use of that as a feedstock that is hopefully going to align well with demand, in particular on the energy side. And as the technology catch catches up to be able to use that for these, um, for bio-based energy, for sustainable energy in particular, this aviation fuel space is, is growing. Um, I think there's significant opportunities there. May I add a, co a comment here? You know, I think Talking from our perspective, we are turning literally a uh, shell into something that, you know, a consumer would pay a price for. Um, and their willingness to pay for a price, you know, like, like this is, is equivalent to, a, like, say, a plant other plant-based drink. So I think this is a, this yeah. is a huge value creation, um, you know, coming from this, this uh, perspective that we don't process first the nut into the different elements and then sell one of it, which is the kernel. And the, with the rest, we you know, break our heads to thinking about how can we put some value into it. We have another perspective. We come from how can we produce this value which is in it from the very, very first moment directly into food. That's another perspective. So in terms of volume, I think hulls definitely mm -hmm. outplay the shells because mm -hmm. of the trees before. Um, but the shells, you know, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge um, amount of shells if we think about all the nuts in this world. Uh, and that's the potential for, for feeding also the, the, the human population with, uh, with uh, healthy stuff. Obviously using shells in human food is a higher value than shells for livestock bedding. <laughs> but yeah. Mike. Yeah, Josette, I'd just like to to compliment you and the panel, I just think it's outstanding. You know, I've, I've served as a proud member on the biomass committee, and you can really tell that things are really starting to click. Yeah. And um, Wong Wei, I want to really thank you for all the work that you've done and all your leadership. Um, Taylor, I wanted to ask you a question. C the product that you're producing uh, from a textile side, can you call it 100% or do you have to use um, binders to try and keep the uh, material t uh, together? Yeah, sure. So Thank you. MMC fibers are reconstituted cellulose. That is what it is. So it is 100% cellulose. And those names, again, are pretty misleading. Lyocell sounds like a synthetic fiber, but it is just 100% cellulose. So it is 100% cellulose drawn from natural cells. Agrilose is 100% cellulose, and the fiber made from agrilose is 100% cellulose. But Taylor, you might explore a little bit more about the, the byproduct generated from your processes. Your basically, there is no waste. There's yeah, there is no waste. and right. the other solutions. Yeah. <laughs> Wang Wei was, has been instrumental in our project. So he, he's <laughs> like, talk more about this. Um, so our process is, at its core, a fractionation process. And this goes into what, Karen, you were just saying about the woody biomass in, in the state and in the space. So what our technology does is it breaks the plant material into its core building blocks. So what agrilose is, is the high quality cellulose that we're able to isolate from the plant. We do post-processing to that high quality cellulose and we're able to turn it into fiber. The other two products that come out of the system are hemicellulose and lignin, and those have other industrial applications, one of which is biofuels. So we can ferment the hemicellulose into bio biofuels and support that growing industry. And lignin has myriad applications, lots of different interesting things are being done with lignin. So it is a zero waste system. All of the plant is used and goes into both industries or many different mm -hmm. industries. Okay. Come on. <laughs> so the bean facility that you talked about, what will that be able to do? So I think one of the challenges might be, Taylor, for is having wood stock that's clean to mm -hmm. use and ready to use. Will beans be able to do stuff like that? 
Yes, I'm so excited about this campus, y'all. So we're, um, we've really designed, we're in the, we've just completed the first phase of design. Um, there are two next phases of engineering that will take place over the first half of 2024 um, before construction begins. Um, and um, the, the really the intent and the vision for this test bed facility is to be flexible for a variety of feedstocks and a variety of end products. There are multiple platforms. So there is conventional firm fermentation, food grade fermentation, um, some emerging spaces. We are very interested in the gas fermentation space, which is more emerging in the bio-industrial manufacturing realm and is especially interesting for use of more diverse and heterogeneous feedstocks, not to get too wonky about it all. Um, and then we are currently exploring and validating the extent to which we're going to be supporting cellular ag and a number of other kind of different um, kind of technology platforms, um, if, you, if you will. Um, so there's kind of a number of different types of processes and um, uh, feed, again, feedstocks and end products that can be supported, validated, and scaled up um, through this facility. You can think of it, if you are familiar with kind of different levels of scale in the bioproduction arena, as demonstration. Um, scale is what we are especially focused on to help fill that gap between lab and pilot scale viability and commercial scale production um, because the dynamic for many um, innovative products in this space is that if you can prove out something at the lab or even pilot scale, um, the literal bugs behave differently at a you know 5,000 liter fermentation tank as they would in a 500,000 liter fermentation tank and so you need to have um, ability to test them in the middle tier. Um, so we're looking at supporting a variety of things to get more into that kind of how much across the upstream and downstream of the supply chain will this campus support. We have a number of different downstream related processes and technologies that will be um, available and supported in terms of capacity on site. Um, and then the vision is to have co-location opportunities for upstream stuff that happens in the preparation of the feedstock for use in the actual bioproduction. So a little bit gets technical. If anyone is interested in the weeds on that, we are very actively right now soliciting feedback from prospective customers, users, and partners of this innovation campus and are also thinking very intentionally about the upstream supply chain and how we will make it easy for growers and producers to plug into this supply chain and become feedstock providers through some shared infrastructure um, in this arena. Did that answer your question? Paul, it's Kevin Long with Midturn Huller. So as a Huller manager, our job is to sell our co-products at the highest prices we can <laughs> for our members. And you know, Paul, you got a slide that says they're re relatively inexpensive. And I think on the beam, if I go back to the almost your next to last slide, it said just for the cost of transportation, you could get uh, the feedstock. Well, that's that's uh, that that's you got to get past that because it's not free and it's, we don't want it to be cheap. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something you'll have to kind of get through as it competes with the dairy mm -hmm. feed that we're using it for. Question for you: Is it Taylor? Yeah, Taylor. Mm -hmm. So would you ever consider every huller gets woody waste delivered with field almonds? Would you ever consider the woody waste from all the different hullers in this state? for maybe for your project. Absolutely, okay. yeah, I mean, th that's, that's been part of your, oh, Yeah, sorry. just to clarify, they are part of the tree, they're like the sticks yes, as opposed yeah. to the trunk, but mm -hmm. yes, it's same tree. That's <laughs> great, as long as it's part of the tree, we're, <laughs> we're fine. It does matter that it comes from an almond tree, which is a hardwood. Yes. And, and then a follow-up from one of my grower members here, what about vineyard uh, tr vines? Is that mm. something that's, mm. right? That's a great question. We haven't evaluated it yet. I mean, our work with the Almond Board was our first phase of the project with Almond Board was to evaluate the input material to make sure we had the, the necessary requirements. We met the minimum necessary requirements that we knew we could get there. Uh, so we haven't evaluated vineyard waste yet. We would be very interested in doing so down the line, but open to the possibility for sure. I did want to respond to the comment yeah, on yeah, the I was, cost. I was gonna do unless it too. you want to. I can just I, wing. I, so I, they look the the feedstock reliability assessment from BDO zone looked at hulls, shells, and woody bias, the whole collection of those. 
we recognize holes are not just at cost of transportation. Absolutely. That's very clear, as we mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we recognize that's the highest value co-product we have, and whatever might think about using that as a feedstock is going to have to compete with dairy prices. So there's no intent to undermine that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. We actually have, it's, but if you think about volume, we've got shells and trees that were also part of that assessment. Those are currently at your transportation costs. If the grower didn't have to pay to do whole orchard recycling, I think we'd get some hands raised if you would haul those trees off. I'm seeing a lot of nodded heads. Yeah. It's very expensive. Um, I would also say we had two hullers and shellers on the um, advisory committee for this product project, so they review the assessment to make sure it is sound with current business um, as potential feedstock suppliers, absolutely. So definitely did not want to imply we're making holes uh, for free. That's, that's opposite yeah. of what we're trying to do absolutely. here is just diversify so that we get more value for everything with the holes really having some pretty solid value at the moment. Yeah. And this analysis that just to underscore, that bullet point where it says majority of feedstock that is talking about volume yeah. inclusive of entire, you know, the orchards, trees. The yeah. tree. yeah. All right. Modesto, 70 so that, miles. So 75 miles surrounding Modesto. Mm -hmm. Modesto. There's a, the center point is actually a specific industrial site in Modesto, and then it's the 75 mile, mile radius around, which approximately is the same as that tri-county North San Joaquin Valley region I mentioned, San Joaquin, Stanislaus, and Merced counties. Hanford, is that bottom town? <laughs> I don't know. I can add while she's trying to figure that out. Yeah. Um, the Almond Board has the intention of funding at least two yeah. of these BDO zone ratings because of the methodology of including, you know, is there land, is there facility space is part of the evaluation. It's not just the feedstock itself, but can you get permits? Is there a place to actually locate a facility? It has to be very site specific and you can't get too big or the economics start to change quite dramatically. So we have the intention of doing a second one of these in the Southern San Joaquin. Um, and it's just a question of sequencing and letting this one get a little bit of um, visibility and play before we take on a second one that will be more in the Fresno to Bakersfield region. Tommy. Uh, similar to, let's see, let me get this up, to what Mike said, I want to commend everybody on there for trying to make more uses for almond byproducts. Um, we have two companies. One is a byproduct company that uses uh, waste and turns it into food streams for cattle feed livestock, both domestically and abroad. But we also have, a, and I was talking to Joe said about this, an almond oil brand that we interface mm -hmm. with consumers. So we're trying to, along with Guangwei, pioneer a new segment of the market. And one of the things we hear so often still is that nomenclature that almonds are water wasters and things of that nature that, oh, they're so bad for the environment. So my only comment to the group was, keep doing what you're doing, tell everybody about it, and it would be nice, to, and, and I'm aware of the CAST program, I think that's fantastic. It would be nice to have a collaborative marketing message where, similar to the Upcycled Food Association, which I've been on yep. a couple of their panels before, because almonds are great products and our oil is an upcycled ingredient. It would be nice to have a collaborative effort and say, they're doing this, they're doing that, and have a messaging that at the end of the day, will serve all of our brands well, mm -hmm. but also will probably initiate a conversation and a thought notion amongst consumers that, wow, okay, almonds aren't water wasters. They have this byproduct that can go to replace the plastic. This byproduct can go to replace these things. Like So these are all tremendous initiatives. I love what you guys are doing, and I think the industry would be served well, everybody in this room, to be able to have a collaborative voice and to continue to tell that message and get that notion flipped that, hey, almonds are supporting more than just a nutritional diet and sucking water from, you know, the environment as well, so. Absolutely, we say we grow four crops for every drop. So that one drop of almond gives you a very nutritious, uh, pro high protein, shelf stable food, but it also gives you all these other things. And even currently, if you attended this morning's session, but, um, the amount of water that we save by feeding those holes to the dairy industry is phenomenal mm -hmm. um, because they're not growing another crop to, to feed those cows. They're using our holes. Um, it reduces our carbon footprint. Um, these are all stories that um, we are elevating attention to. And the more that 
they actually start taking place commercially, the more yeah. powerful that story becomes. So yeah, definitely on our radar. And I think Elmore does do a great job of that. If we could get we brand, can always do more. Brand, well, but I mean, <laughs> brand voices can be an extension of what you're doing. Absolutely. People don't ex exactly follow the Almond Board as right. often as we oh, want, right? Totally. Or the internet, Facebook, and so at a brand level, keep telling that message, please. Yeah. May I, may I comment on that? I think that's a really great point you raise because looking at it, you know, um, from on a global scale and what we see in Europe also is that the plant-based drinks, for example, that are not almonds, you know, they claim that the uh, almonds use a lot of water and stuff like that, especially the oat, oat milk guys, oh yeah. yeah, right? Oh yeah. Switzerland, we, I we presume, right? Is it oatly from <laughs> Switzerland? Uh, yeah, no, it's all over in Europe, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, the company companies coming from the north of Europe and... Uh, they have done a quite a good job also, you know, fighting, uh, overcoming and, and, you know, bringing the arguments of sa sustainability against the yeah. almond drinks, you know. So I think um, one of the great potentials that we have now here with this is uh, bringing the almond industry in food mm -hmm. um, in, in, a, in, a, in a better competitive situation versus the, co the other nut types yeah. in food, right? Um, and it's also a question of pricing. So if we bring the shells as waste material of a couple of sounds per pound into a food product that somebody is disposed to pay the price of another competitive product with a better margin. So that, is, that might be a great you know, a strategy for, for regaining with the nut drinks on, on a global scale. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think developing some of these upcycled ingredients, whether it's whole yeah. shell or even inedible almonds, making them into an almond oil, as we were talking yeah. about, you can lift up the value of our production here significantly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I do think it's so interesting, you know, just that said earlier that the, just globally, there's, the country doesn't really have a grasp of how much happens in California in terms mm -hmm. of agriculture. I think most people, again, don't really understand how their food is made, <laughs> where it yeah, comes from. Yeah. I, as like coming from the apparel side, it's the same thing in apparel. So I do think there's a really interesting yeah. opportunity to, to be forward about, as part of branding, an educational piece, right? About like, this is how much this is actually offsetting your carbon footprint, yeah. and here's how to talk about it. Yeah. So I think that that's something we see in I'm often surprised, industries. and we interact with both customers on the consumer with the brand level, and then even buyers of Costco, Whole Foods, Raley's. It's like they you know, are supposed to be close to the industry, but there's still a big gap in education and understanding mm -hmm. about what we do, what you know, almonds serve as a greater purpose, and so it's like, okay, like let's get together, and every little bit counts. Uh, towards telling that message. So again, we could all echo each other's sentiments here and yeah. you know, flip that script from a branding level, then I think that'd be a tremendous uh, move. Some of us have a meeting this afternoon to continue talking about how we're gonna elevate our, s our stewardship and environmental story. So we're not done yet. We'll yeah. keep working hard on behalf of the industry. Well, we got one of the best right here. So we host a balloon Absolutely. party for our brand every year, Christine's <laughs> Orchard. So we love trying to tell stories about her bee programs. She, she'll she get does. the very first uh, almond wood uh, article of clothing, I think. <laughs> Can I have the second? <laughs> no. Anybody else? Any other comments or questions? Yeah, Wes. I really feel part of the Almond family when I yeah. can like call you guys by name. That's great. Yeah, thank you again to all you speakers. Um, as a grower, I would love to see um, more uses of the whole in human you know, consumption yeah. for, for dietary needs. What are the barriers to entry for you guys? And are there any things, any, anything that the farmers can do to help promote that use from a farming aspect? So you guys can uh, elaborate on that. Um, I'll, I'll start with what I know. And then I don't know, Roland, just in general, you work in that segment. Um, so I think at this stage, the barrier is that almond hulls will be competing against other sources of dietary fiber that could be added into food. So um, I'm not a food formulation specialist, but things like chicory fiber, um, whatever's in Metamucil, I can't, psyllium fiber. There, there are some established um, plant-based fibers that are used as food ingredients. Um, and so almond hulls will have to compete with that on price on um, availability and just frankly getting the attention of food companies. Um, so I think where we have a value added story to tell that hopefully will attract food brands is on sort of that 
upcycled food component. This was not purpose grown. You've heard this in several cases uh, across this. This was not purpose grown to add into food, which chicory and psyllium would have been purpose grown for. This is, you're getting um, the value add of, of using the kernel and all those other products in terms of um, the sustainability story around that. Um, you know, there's in the upcycled food arena, this whole concept of, you know, you have maybe you have a product that has an actual nut, almond nut in it, and then you have the almond hull. It's like a whole almond product. So, um, so there can be some marketing value in having the kernel and the hull together. But really getting attention um, among food companies and getting them products, uh, getting the whole product to, in their hands to formulate with is where we're going and we'll see what the barriers are. I mean, this is an education, but we have a lot of people in our industry to help educate what the Almond Board should do and that's a real valuable role that the, the committees play and, and um, you know, we, we need that knowledge of what the food industry, um, how they go about formulation as a way to help us figure out what are those barriers and just keep talking to a lot of people. Well, I think the hulls, they are very valuable. Um, first, it's in terms of mass, it's just a huge amount of uh, yeah. material. Um, and the second thing, you know, from the food perspective, which makes the hulls interesting, is they, uh, the shells we heard, you know, they promote and provide the fiber. Uh, the hulls provide the protein, and they also contain sugar. So, you know, that's a perfect combination. So we are, you know, we're thinking about that, and I'm sure that will there will be some solutions there also in the future. But uh, you know, we started with the shells and uh, see what's next. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> How many calories in that cookie that you made? <laughs> yeah, um, fewer than a regular cookie, yeah, I think, is the answer. Definitely fewer. <laughs> uh, we didn't count the calories, ac uh, actually. Uh, <laughs> But uh, the person behind you, Tilo, is the co-inventor with me of this uh, process. And uh, he surely can talk about that. I think we have about uh, 25 or 20 percent of the recipe is made with the uh, renut almond flour. And the rest is still using some wheat flour. Okay, so we um, ask, ask the professor <laughs> behind you. I don't know. He didn't bake them. Roland uh, didn't bake them. Uh, uh, <laughs> I simply don't want to say a calorie number. I, I don't know, I, but you know, it'd be fewer than a regular cookie for sure. Because as you said, you're, you're, you're it's like yes. the bar that I showed you, the Cliff Bar, where it had 30 fewer calories than the standard formulation, but importantly, half the carbohydrates because that fiber is a really key part to reducing the total carbohydrate. I didn't. I didn't get the question. Uh, the question was: Have have you talked to any of the companies that make those sort of fiber-rich yeah, yeah, sure, cookies? Yeah, sure. We're in discussion with yeah. both. You know, the the uh, let's say uh, nut processor ingredient providers, and especially also with the consumer food companies. You know, they see the platforms for consumers, the fiber, the less sugar approach, etc. Antioxidants shell contain also anti antioxidant polyphenols, as all the shells from the plant. So that's mm -hmm. in interesting stuff, which is in there. And I think um, that's, that's the perspective that we want to put into the discussion, right? It is, it is the whole has a, has a huge value. So let's, let's uh, explore the, the best way, uh, of this to, to leverage this up. And, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. that was part of the original <coughs> motivation for go down this path is we need more diversify in case there aren't as many cows as but we it's, used to But it's have. an interesting question, you know, with the, with the fiber in the cookies, et cetera, because Fiber, it gives you a sort of feeling of satisfaction in the stomach. So you stop eating much more because you feel like you're already, you know, satisfied. That is a huge benefit. Whether being the fiber soluble or not, uh, we with the shell mostly add non-soluble fiber. So this just goes through a body's uh, digestion, right? But it's, it's a big advantage because you, you have a, a satisfactory feeling that uh, stop <laughs> makes you stop eating all the time. Which is, which is a big value a add, yeah. you know, and also if you look at the population and the aging population, et cetera, the fiber 
the, uh, the lack of fiber we have is, is a huge topic. And a lot of people say this whole protein hype now, that's great, it's not over, but fiber is next. Great, we have a question here. Uh, hi, my name is Kenny Thomas from Liberty Ranch FFA. Uh, before I ask my question, I say, get a cookie. The cookies are really good, honestly. <laughs> They're <laughs> shockingly really good. I had one and I was like, whoa, this is really great. Um, <laughs> Obviously, I don't work in this industry. I'm still in high school. I just started high school. But I feel like you guys did a really great job with the presentation. I learned a lot. I never knew almonds can do as much as you guys demonstrated and explained. So I just want to say good job on that because I would have never knew any of that. But I do, I, I realize that with the, with the clothes and all like the reusing almonds and every part of almond, I know you guys are trying to like ha make almonds have like a lot of purposes. So is there any like... I don't really know how to say this, but is there any like other things you guys would like to see almonds be useful for in the future that you guys haven't talked about or no? I would like to fly in a plane that's fueled by almonds. Um, <laughs> let's say that. Uh, <laughs> turn on my light switch fueled by almonds. Drive a car fueled by almonds. I can come up with a bunch of them. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, I just can't say enough. I mean, it, as we sat through some other sessions here, you know, from a nutritional standpoint, it's almost a superfood. I mean, it really is amazing compared the package of, in, of um, health benefits that you get because it does have fiber in it. It's high in protein. It has, um, it's very high in specific vitamins and minerals. Um, so it has just an enormous range of health benefits. And the fact that we're a zero waste industry now, like very tiny amounts of any of our um, products, the sticks, okay, the sticks at the Hullers and Shellers are still a problem. I'm not oh, sure those actually you know. go to productive use mm -hmm. at the moment. I I've seen some air curtain burners on that. But, um, <laughs> but otherwise, the hulls, the shells all get used currently, but looking for higher value um, brings do more dollars back to the industry and as we've talked about here just really helps the consumer connect to feeling good about eating those products but yeah I'd like to say the sky's the limit if I could ever fly on a plane fueled by almonds. I, I one of the ideas I'm thinking and this may be nut jobs um, job <laughs> um, packaging for food mm, yeah that's disposable you know how much packaging do we get that we just throw away yeah yeah, I'm Holy in grail. discussions right now in a design work for uh, creating a whole line of packaging for the almond industry out of almond shell and hull. So it's, it's on the way. We definitely have some food brands asking it, it about that. It will be on the way, and, <laughs> and uh, we're looking forward to those co-branding opportunities and really telling a great story uh, made here in California and all the packaging from California out of the source material. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about that. Excellent. Stay tuned. Uh, yeah, we're, come, we're to <laughs> this, come to this session uh, at every time because we'll just, just keep uh, laddering up to more and more interesting things. <laughs> you just raised the bar there, but <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> all right. I am, oh, wait, one more, one Thomas. More. Have we looked into pasteurizing holes? Because if we're going to be able to market them in a food brand, obviously we have to pasteurize them. Uh, no, because we do have an understanding of the food safety um, risks associated with holes. Because it's a it's a low moisture food, mm -hmm. it actually isn't uh, significantly pathogenic. We, we do analyze the holes regularly. They will have to be cleaned up in a food ingredient. They're not going to go from the hole or sheller into the food line yeah. there will be a cleaning process obviously and that would have to be part of the business proposition there yeah. well christine brought up a good point i mean if we're going to be marketing them as food grade it might potential for an off-ground harvesting mechanism and that would absolutely my just thought of the pasteurizing was if we every domestic pound we sell has to be pasteurized i right. imagine holes would probably have to fall under that so we would have to find either a steam mm -hmm. or a ppo way yeah. well but not Let's necessarily. Let's get a whole pasture pasture pasture. Pasture. Tesco in then, huh? <laughs> you just no, gotta come and <laughs> join our industry because this is where Almond it happens. Board, Almond Board Leadership Program alum. That's what. Yeah, you there you go. There you go. 
All right, well, thank you again to this outstanding panel.